trendsetting, crowd-pleasing, outlandish. It's the concept car, a fantasy vehicle filled with possibility and wonder. But don't fall in love with that Nissan IDX or Porsche Mission E, because the reality is the rubber will never meet the road. What? It's just a showpiece. Ah! So why build these dream machines if they're never expected to roll off the assembly line? This is Wheelhouse, and we're talking concept cars. Concept cars are often stuffed with innovative and over-the-top features, but lack economic viability or practical application. They are dream big cars, and automakers will spend the time and money to show off new technology and styling, or simply to gauge customers' reaction to new ideas. In the early days of the auto industry, the only people building them were the people who had before been building coaches, and that's why they looked like horseless coaches. In 1896, the French, I don't know, all of them, launched an effort to set the automobile apart from the horseless carriage. A well-known department store in Paris held a contest and invited all types of creatives, from painters, sculptors, and even architects to come up with their own ideas for a modern motor car. The winning entry was by an architect and furniture designer named Pierre Selmersheim. His scale model design, called the Car House, was made of wax, cardboard, and glass, and was a fairly radical and advanced model for the time. I mean, look at it. It looks like a steampunk funny car. That's the first and last time I'll ever mention steampunk on this show. While Selmersheim's car house never got past the sketch and model stage, many concept cars that got built featured some pretty impressive designs. With improved infrastructure and safety of paved roads in the US, car designers were able to trade the rugged, bulky, tractor-like models for more attractive-looking vehicles. The decade also saw a fascination with the burgeoning aviation industry, and the automobile was even seen as your own personal flying machine. One concept car to capitalize on this was the Auburn Cabin Speedster. Their concept car design was promoting as having the speed of a racing car with the comfort of a closed car. The cabin on this beauty was pushed to the back of the car and was characterized as cabin rearward. The hood was long and sleek. Designed in 1928, just a year after Charles Lindbergh made his famous transatlantic flight, the aeronautical themes of the Auburn Cabin Speedster are clear-cut. Position yourself behind the wheel and you might think you were in the cockpit of a two-seater airplane. Sadly, the excitement over the Auburn was short-lived. While on display at a car show, either a cigarette was carelessly discarded or there was an electrical short because the tent went up in flames and 320 cars were lost, including the Auburn Auburn Cabin Speedster. This car had a ton of influence. You put it next to the Jaguar E-Type or Dodge Viper or even the Mercedes GT and the lineage is pretty clear. Moving into the 1930s, we actually saw a couple concept cars that predated the minivan of today. Buckminster Fuller was a famous inventor and visionary of the 20th century. He was an accomplished poet, architect, engineer, mathematician, the list goes on. You name it, he probably did it. And he built one of the most significant and progressive cars ever. The Dymaxion was a 20-foot long, pod-like, three-wheeled contraption that Fuller didn't see as radical, but as logical. This highly streamlined car used a Ford V8 at the rear to drive the two front wheels. And the single back wheel steered the car like the rudder of a ship. It could carry up to 11 passengers, got 30 miles to the gallon, and claimed to travel as fast as 120 miles per hour. This thing is awesome. I could see it in a Wes Anderson movie. The Dymaxion could turn on a dime, and parallel parking was a breeze. Just pivot its wheels toward the curb and zip sideways into the parking space, like a crab or something. And there were no rear windows, just a periscope. Eccentric, definitely, but it was also stylish, efficient, and attracted lots of attention. Celebrities wanted to take it for a spin, and the rich wanted to invest in it. Unfortunately, the same month that Fuller applied for a patent, one of his prototype Dymaxions crashed and killed the driver. Ultimately, only three Dymaxions were completed before Fuller ran out of money. Curiously enough, a few years ago, a guy built a replica of the Dymaxion and said it was the scariest driving experience of his life. Yeah, no duh, it handles like a forklift, but can go 120. The 1938 Buick Y-Job was the brainchild of General Motors design chief Harley Earl. This guy represented a whole new approach to auto design. His guiding principle was oblongs are more attractive than squares. Harley's intention was to build a dream car that would test the boundaries of consumer taste. So why is it called the Y-Job? Experimental cars had already used the X designation, but Harley believed this was beyond experimental. And what comes after X? Y! With its aviation-influenced design, this two-seat convertible was the first Buick to use the bombsite hood ornament and featured 
power-operated hidden headlights, recessed tail lamps, flush door handles, electric windows and doors, and a hidden power-operated convertible top in 1938. Technological innovations that were way ahead of their times from the 30s. And every one of these devices found their way into production cars. In 1939, the press called the Y job more than a concept car. It was the car of the future. This observation was dead on because the oblong-shaped, long and low slung body of the Y job had a massive influence on American car design that lasted well into the 50s. When you look at the car, you're probably thinking, oh, I've seen that before. And you might have, but you might just think you have because for almost two decades, manufacturers were trying their best to emulate it. In the 1950s and 60s, the auto industry's concept cars still reflected a love affair with aircraft, but the approach was more futuristic. It's no wonder, because with the space race, it was game on, and jet planes and research rockets were blazing across the sky. So car makers were inspired by this exciting jet age. Oldsmobile was a powerhouse in the 50s and was also very ambitious. In 1956, it showed its bold side with the shark-nosed Golden Rocket. The Golden Rocket was jaw-dropping, sporty, and strange. It had round headlights tucked between the skinny grille and high-set missile-like fenders. Its luxury features included a power-tilting steering column and seats that automatically raised and swiveled when the doors opened. Unfortunately, few of its chic styling features made its production, with the exception of the incredible wraparound split rear window treatment which appeared in the 1963 Corvette. Around the same time, General Motors took an even bolder step in its concept car designs with GM's Firebird show cars. These series of concept Firebirds were built not just to showcase futuristic design, but also to test the usefulness of gas turbine engines in passenger cars. The GM Firebird 3's aim was to build upon the high-speed ability of the first Firebird model and the electronic feats of the second Firebird model. This extreme jet fighter-shaped vehicle was, to say the least, astounding. The GM Firebird 3 offered a keyless entry system and a double bubble canopy continuing with the Jet H3 of the first two Firebirds. The Firebird 3 would be the only one in the series that actually influenced the design of GM cars. You'll find the Firebird's rear skegs, kind of a weird name, or the stubby little fins that hung down off the bottoms of the rear fenders on the 1961 Cadillac. With no parallel lines and very little chrome, the Firebird 3 broke a number of GM styling rules, and that's one of the reasons it became such a significant design. This car series also delved into a surprising range of technologies that can be found in current car models. Anti-lock braking systems, body panels, and powered luggage compartment platforms? That's not as exciting as the first ones. Fast forward 30 years and the landscape of concept cars shifted. We were seeking not just sleek and flashy designs, but also cars aimed at particular lifestyles. You see, in the 1980s, market research found that consumers under 35 were interested in buying vehicles that would match their leisure and recreational life, like hiking, biking, camping, kayaking, surfing, all those other things you see on Tinder profiles. With the burgeoning sport utility market beginning to dominate the late 80s and into the 90s, Pontiac responded with the 1989 concept car called the Stinger. This neon green, open top, two-door dune buggy Jeep combo was a true attention grabber. The Stinger was aimed directly at young buyers who spent all their time at the beach and needed a vehicle that centered entirely around the beach-going experience. The folks at Pontiac went all out with an endless supply of gadgets electric memory seats and steering wheel, a control panel hidden in the driver's side door, seats made of wetsuit material that could be used as beach chairs, and a removable roof panel. You could also raise the rear seats up 15 inches at the flip of a switch. But wait, there's even more, a CD player, a detachable AM FM stereo, binoculars with a carrying case. Why are you like spying on a nude beach with this car? A pull-out drawer that stored two long distance cell phones, a drink cooler mounted in the doors, a tool case, an extension cord, an extension cord? Two dust busters, a first aid kit, a sewing kit, a flashlight, a camping table, biking bags, and I'm not kidding, a garden hose to hose it out with. I'll say it again, a garden hose. Crammed with all that, you may wonder, is there anything the Stinger couldn't do? Well, it couldn't get made. Even though it's unlikely a production version of the Stinger would have to come equipped with all those extras, a roofless beachcombing 4x4 with some of that stuff would be pretty sweet. It seems Pontiac bigwigs at the time were eager to produce the Stinger, but they decided with all those extra features, it wouldn't be cost effective to build. And you'd have to get your dustbuster at the Black & Decker, like 
the rest of us. One of my favorite concept cars rolled out in the late 90s, and it was heralded as the car to save American cars. Buick unveiled their lacrosse concept. It was sleek and rear-wheel drive with a powerful V8, and it had suicide doors. Surely, this meant Buick was back in the game. The lacrosse did make it to production about a decade later as an unremarkable family sedan. For concept cars, it's a glamorous, although short, life expectancy. Most are dismantled after they've made the rounds at years given car shows, on display at a museum, or end up in the hands of private buyers via an auction house. But sometimes car makers actually promise the future and deliver. Tesla was one concept car that made it to production against all odds. Debuting at a private event in SoCal, the electric 2009 Tesla Model S show car housed enough battery power to boast an estimated 300 mile range. The proposed specs on the sleek sedan were ambitious. A 45 minute quick charge, a 17 inch infotainment system with 3G wireless connectivity and a top speed of 120 and much more. It honestly sounded impossible and a lot of people said it would never make it to market. However, in 2012, Elon Musk and his team delivered on their performance claims with the Tesla Model S. The dual motor version hit 60 miles per hour in 3.2 seconds and had a range of 295 miles, a truly impressive feat. And it's because of this car, the big dogs of the industry are taking electric cars seriously, and that's awesome. With environmentally friendly and sustainable energy the name of the game nowadays, the 2000s and beyond have seen a big focus on green concept cars. Now we have concept cars debuting at venues outside of auto shows. Chinese startup Byton unveiled an all-electric SUV concept at this year's Consumer Electronics Show. This polished four-door features voice and gesture controls and face recognition technology that will probably break after like two years. Side mirrors are nixed and replaced with cameras, and of course there's autonomous capabilities. Earlier this year, Lexus introduced the striking LF1, limitless concept car. With the goal of making the driving experience easier, this slick luxury crossover offers expansive touch controls on the steering wheel and a touchpad on the center console, because what we need is more touchscreens. Its bold but beautiful body curves give the appearance of melted steel or a rumpled satin sheet. These cars are a chance for designers to push the envelope and display radical designs that may never see production, but at least gives consumers an idea of what the future may bring. For those of us around in 2050, we're sure to see autonomous driving vehicles. And if that's the reality, will a steering wheel even be necessary? We put out cool stuff pretty much every single day, so hit that yellow subscribe button right there. Go to shop.donut.media, get on our email list so you never miss that. If you wanna know more about concept cars, here's an up to speed on a car that was one at one point. It's the Acura NSX. Check out Science Garage. Be nice, see you later. Bye, Reggie.